we sort of went full into um, presidential mode, although our first thing that we did was form a political action committee called Fund for a Healthy America, which I think a lot of people didn't know that we did or have long forgotten, but that's what we did um, in 2001. It's a way to, so you can travel around the country when you're thinking or exploring or trying to figure out if you want to run for president. Then by, you know, that was at the end of 2001. By May of 2002, Howard knew, hey, I'm really going to do it. So that's when we formed Dean for America, which everybody obviously knew about. Um, and in two, Howard was still governor in 2002, so we spent 2002 trying to do both things. Um, spent pretty much half the year out of state, half the year in state. And then when Howard left the governor's office in 2003, he was a full-time candidate. So what I try to do in this book, it's not one of these um, scholarly analysis of the campaign, because I thought, who am I to be the scholar? Um, I could give it a different take on what was going on. And what I tried to do was do a journal. It's more in a journal format, day to day, and it talks about the big issues that were going on. But it also sort of talks about the daily things that you go through on a presidential campaign that no one knows that you do. You know, especially when we started out um, in 2001 and 2002, it was Howard who. You know, nobody knew who he was, and we'd go to places and they'd look at us like we were crazy. Like, who are you people and why are you here? Um, and it wasn't until, you know, mid-2003 that anybody was like, wow, I'm really excited I get to meet Howard Dean. So what this book is, it's this, the journey of here are these, here's Howard traveling around the country, staying in people's houses, um, the little-known candidate and who we met with, where we went, and it, and it really goes through the, um, you know, here we are, we've gotten, we've gotten to the top. So, and it also talks about the food we ate, how much we didn't sleep, um, and uh, dealing with the other candidates, dealing with the news media. So I hope that when people, I know um, Josh said that, you know, he's gotten and, and talked about it, and I do talk about what the grassroots played, what role the grassroots played in the campaign. Um, so it was an adventure to do it, So sorry. sorry. Sorry, Sally. I'm in trouble. Um, <laughs> so what I tried to do in this book is really give somebody a sense of what it's like to be on the campaign trail, what it's like to run for president in a way that you don't get to see in a 30-second soundbite on television or in that, you know, two-column story in Howard's favorite newspaper, the New York Times. You know, so I, I hope, you know, that people will read it, and if you read it, you enjoy it. I know I've gotten a lot of emails from people all over the country who were volunteers on the campaign, who, you know, like Josh, they, they recognize something, oh, I was there. So I think it's had an, it's um, a fun read, and um, I always have to thank Howard, one, for supporting the book, but also for running for president so I could write the book. <laughs> So I'm going to let Howard say, say a few words, and you know, I'm happy to, when we get to the time to take any questions about the book, the campaign, or whatever anybody wants to talk about. Um, well, first let me thank All Souls Church, and especially uh, DFA uh, New York. Um, this has been, uh, th this is a great, great group, and Josh, thank you for your leadership and all the people with the Sally, all the people who've done all the events, you can do the events, and where are some of the other folks around? Anyway, thank you. Um, secondly, I would be remiss if I didn't introduce my mother, who's here in the crowd. So thank you. <laughs> and also, when she's going to kill me for this charity, Clark, who worked in our office <laughs> before she became a big time New York lawyer. And how, Howard hasn't seen it, but David Rice, you didn't see David. David, David Rice is also a Vermonter. He was, he was about 15 when he worked in our yeah. office. <laughs> Uh, so thank you guys for coming. So uh, and only thank Kate for writing the book. I think now I don't, you know, I didn't write this book. I don't get any royalties. I can say any, any damn well thing I please, and as you know, I've made a career out of that. <laughs> uh, but this is the best campaign book I've ever read, and the reason is it's not me and snotty like um, like the, all the Washington books. It just tells the story about what really happened. It's no, there's not a lot of analysis. There's not a lot of Washington BS. Um, it's just what happened day to day. And for, so it's an ideal book for anybody who cared deeply about the campaign. Of course, most of the people in this room did and were involved in it. As Kate said, 
This is what a presidential campaign is really like. It isn't what you read in Game Change or All the President's Men or any of those things. It is like, those are colorful stories and there are stories. I mean, they're not always entirely true and you can't tell if they're true or not. This is an, a, a, an at the time record of what went on. And for anybody who had anything to do with the campaign, this is a must and you should, I bought about 25 of them. I'm sending it to all my friends from people, you know, in Washington and Texas. Uh, who, who did all the, all the hard work all across the country. Um, this, I, we've, this is, our, I think, our fourth book, third or fourth? Fourth, fourth. book signing. Uh, the first one out of Vermont. Um, and so um, I, I got to repeat uh, the answer to a question because it was a fun question. It was a, was a fun answer. Of course, I had no idea I was going to say what I said. Um, somebody asked me about um, how we felt about the campaign that we didn't win. And uh, you know, here it is eight years later, I actually think we did win. I mean, there are a lot of people who couldn't tell you who the nominee in 2004 was, but they remember our campaign, and it wasn't just for the scream speech. It was because we stood up for what was Democrats should have been standing up for, uh, and we asked people to behave like Democrats, and we think, thought we could win an election by staying who we were and being proud of it. And the long tradition of all the various liberation movements uh, in this country from women's rights to gay rights to civil rights, we did the same thing. That's all it takes, is people are willing to stand up and say what they believe. And it did transform the country. There were a lot of people in that campaign who were extraordinary people. Uh, there was one young guy, I mean, almost everybody in the campaign was under 25, except for a few um, you know, senior managers, um, so-called. <laughs> and, um, and so this one guy comes over from Sweden, where he's li living with his girlfriend, and he's an American. Uh, he comes to the uh, announcement on, in June, was it June 5th? I think it was, something yeah, like that, yeah. uh, in Burlington, and he says, I gotta stay. And so he walks into the headquarters the next day and volunteers, because of course nobody had any money, so they were, it was all free volunteering. He ends up running our whole tech department with another guy. They both form separate companies. One guy does corporate stuff, and uh, Joe Rosebars, is the guy I'm talking about, uh, decides that he's gonna form his company and do, um, do, uh, it's called, which is called Blue State Digital, and do the tech. So when I took over the DNC six months later, after that we dropped out, I dropped out of the race, or eight months later, uh, I hired him, because the DNC was basically a shell. Uh, it was a great building and nothing in it. So, um, so we rebuilt, so this guy rebuilt all the tech at the DNC, and who should espy him but Barack Obama, and hired him in 2006, so we ran Obama's um, operation. So you can see this, this kind of path from our campaign down through to Barack Obama's campaign. They, of course, were much better organized than uh, we were, and they were really disciplined, and they did a lot, they did a lot of things that, right that we didn't do right. Um, but the essence was empower people by allowing them to use technology and let them make the decisions about how, to, what, how the campaign should run. Some of you will remember the meetups. The meetups were really, we didn't invent the meetups. We didn't invent all this stuff that we get credit for. What we did is watch other people who were young do it and then figure out what they were doing and then figure out how to centralize it. So meetup.com was a, a website that was designed for people who, for example, liked gardening so they could all get together once a month and not just talk online. And um, Kate and I, our, we started, our, started the campaign over a chiropractor's office with one employee um, in, uh, I guess it was 2002, 2002. And, um, so Kate and I are walking down the street in Montpelier, and she turns to me and she says, well, you know, you're number six on Meetup this week. And I said, what is Meetup? So she explained to me. I said, oh, very good. So a couple of weeks later, we're walking down the street in Burlington this time, and she says, well, you're number two on Meetup. And I said, yeah, what's what number one? She says, witches. <laughs> but, so I thought that was ridiculous, of course. There was a survey, Meetup is still in existence, and it's still now being used for what it was supposed to be used for in the first place. You know what the number one thing on Meetup is? Witches, 10 years later. <laughs> So anyway, it was an adapt adapt adaptive campaign. It was a lot of fun, uh, and it was a, it was a, it was a, it was the kind of campaign you are proud of running. We did a lot, made a lot of screw ups. I made a lot of screw ups as a candidate, but it was a it was a good natured campaign. There wasn't a lot of meanness uh, in it, at least uh, at least uh, on the road. <laughs> in the office is another story. There's a little gossip in this book. You should read the office story. <laughs> oh, I just spied my sister in law Leslie, who worked for the campaign too. Um, this is a family affair, right? 
So anyway, it really is a great book, and for those of you who had anything to do with the campaign, you should definitely get it. And it's great reading for if you have friends who are political junkies, maybe, or kids that were a little too young to do all this stuff. It's a nice read, and you don't have to worry about somebody taking their shirt off on the airplane runway. <laughs> Hey, I've got a question about uh, Citizens United. Um, the way you funded your campaign, Small Donors, and which was the, I think it was the first draft of the way Barack Obama funded his campaign, would a campaign like yours in 2003 and 4, and Barack Obama's campaign 2007, 2008, is a campaign like that impossible now in the wake of Citizens United? Campaign is not, but it's not possible to run a campaign unless you have a super PAC, which the president Later, realize a few weeks ago. Romney has spent tens of millions of dollars doing that. Now, I, I think it's despicable. I think the most dangerous people in, to American democracy are the people on the Supreme Court that voted for that. Uh, and nowhere in the Constitution, having read it several times recently, can I find that a corporation has, per, has personhood rights. It's an outrage, and it's the, day, most, it's the worst thing that happened to American democracy as, since I don't know when, a long, long time, certainly not in any of our lifetimes. Um, but it, 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 I'll tell you how bad it is, and it, it's fitting that the Republicans get the first taste of how bad it was, since it was their idea in the first place. So Mitt Romney's going to get his butt kicked by Obama, is my prediction, just plain and simple. And, 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 but I, I thought that Mitt Romney had a great chance at beating Obama six months ago, and one person has changed that, and his name is Shelley Adelson. And he wrote four $5 million checks to Newt Gingrich. Thus prolonged, the Republican primary was going to be over by Florida, just as it was last time. And that, then, then Romney was going to have, and Romney had pretty good numbers in Florida. Now, I mean, by that time, it's now going on eight weeks longer. It's going to go on even longer because Shelley Adelson gave $20 million to a single candidate. I don't think in American democracy it is right for one person to be able to have that kind of an effect on the election. And if Romney doesn't beat Obama, you can all say to Shelley Adelson, you did this. Now, in our case, that's probably a good thing, but it's not good for the country, and it's a hell of a bad, awful way to r r run a democracy. One of the reasons I'm supporting the president, very, I did, you know, I get pretty mad at the president for the first three years, but the fourth year is like the fourth quarter. Everybody's got to get on the same team and know who your team is. You know, even you may be mad about this and mad about that. There's a big difference between the kind of Supreme Court nominees that Barack Obama's going to put on the Supreme Court and the kind of Supreme Court n nominees that, Rich, that Mitt Romney, who will be catering as much as he can to his right wing, is going to put on the Supreme Court. We just need two justices more in addition to the ones we've got that will bring sanity back to the Supreme Court. You know, 70, and it's not just me saying, 73% of Americans believe the Supreme Court is now a political body. That's pretty awful. That's pretty awful. And, uh, and that can be changed, but it can only be changed by the president or by this nascent movement, which will take a long time to create a constitutional amendment to specifically say that corporations do not have any rights other than what's particularly specifically in the law. Well, Roosevelt tried that, he didn't, he didn't succeed. I'm Tracy K. Dunn. Hi, Kate. Hi, Governor. Big fan. Big fan. Um, <laughs> formerly Tracy Dunn. Um, two questions. Number one, May of 2000, when the governor asked you, do you think I should run for president, where did the um, signing of the Civil Unions Bill, which at the time was extremely progressive gay rights legislation, factor into that? And Kate, what, was that going on in your head when you were answering that question to Howard? And my second question is, Governor, you said that you bought 25 books and you're going to send them to a bunch of your friends in a bunch of different states. Could you name those states in an enthusiastic way? <laughs> <laughs> North Carolina, Michigan, Nevada! <laughs> it was about two years ago, Howard was the guest, um, or the the main speaker at Vermont Law School graduation. I don't know if you remember this, Howard. And I happened to go because there was a friend of mine that worked in the governor's office that had, was graduating. So I went, and there must have been a thousand people at this law school graduation. And Howard just, it, you were just you know, giving, it was a great speech, he's going on, and very calmly he said something, I can't even remember what led into it, but he said, and then we're gonna do New Hampshire, blah, 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 you know, and all the states, and everybody in the place, like, they all clapped and laughed, and I thought, oh gosh, it is universally known. They have a, th <laughs> a thousand people under this tent at Vermont Law School, and they, they just thought that was hilarious. It was in, the good con it was in a good context. Um, the civil unions, Howard signed that um, law in April 
of 2000. 2000. Yeah, it was that's 2000. right. It was 2000. That's it was right. April in 2000. He was actually up for re-election for governor in November of 2000. And after he signed um, that legislation, we were actually worried that he wasn't going to get re-elected. In Vermont, you have to get a candidate has to get more than 50 percent, or the election goes to the legislature. And even if you know, we didn't even know we were going to. We you know, like at that point, it was like we didn't even think we were going to get to 50. Um, but even if we did get even a squeaker with the Republican candidate, the legislature turned over and became Republican. It as, a, as a result of the civil unions. Right, as a result yeah. of civil unions. And the Republican candidate ran on the, I'm going to repeal civil unions, as did all the legislators that beat incumbent Democrats. So it looked like it was, hope, you know, not hopeless, but it wasn't looking very good for November. So, but it was about 1,074 votes that pushed Howard over the 50%. So we had like 50.1%, so you know, we, were, we were okay. But I think it was because we were sort of okay. It, when we, when we, it wasn't on that day when Howard, it was November when Howard said, what do you think of it, me running? And it was probably in January when we got together with um, a couple, like two other people. And it, it, was, it was a thought like, you know, he, he's never gonna be able to do this because of civil unions, but it wasn't, it was, you know, Howard is very clear, I'm not going to change my position, this is what it is, so we're going to go for it, because you can't let one, you know, let something like that, that he believed was the right thing to do, get in the way. I mean, obviously it was, not the press made a big deal out of it when he first, um, you know, made ways that he was going to run, and it was in, I think it was July of 2002 that you were on Meet the Press with Tim Russer, and we knew that it was a question that was going to come up. And basically, your answer was, I'd sign it, and I'd sign it again. And um, it really, it didn't beco ever become an issue, which was sort of shocking. So there's three stories I want to tell about this. One is when we're running after signing the Civil Unions Bill, Steve McMahon, who was our consultant, and then went on to become the consultant for the presidential race, looked at me and said, after we just got a poll back, and he said, frankly, Governor, 90% 90 90 of my clients with numbers like these don't get reelected. <laughs> So uh, we did, though. Uh, the second story um, I want to tell is uh, the story about uh, the Civil Unions Bill. Um, I went to see Jimmy Carter, because when you run for president, you really kind of have to touch all the bases, and you've got to go see Mike Dukakis and Jimmy Carter and, and you know, whomever. It's, it's a courtesy call, the f former nominees and all this. And Jimmy Carter, I cut my teeth in Vermont politics working for Jimmy Carter's reelection campaign as an envelope sticker, stuffer, and all that stuff. when. And so, and so I'd met him once or twice, but I didn't certainly know him. And so we go down to Georgia. Um, I don't know if you were on this trip or not, but, it, but there wasn't many people in the campaign at this point. And so I get an appointment with him at the Carter Center, and I go in. He's 80 years old at the time. And I said, well, you know, Mr. President, we're talking. And he said, well, I, I think you should go ahead and do it. I think you should do it. And I said, well, Mr. President, I, I'm a little worried about the civil unions bill. I'm not too sure you know, that that's going to be widely accepted by the American people. And he goes, well, I, you know, I, I left the Southern Baptist Church of an issue like this. I'm now an American Baptist, which is some kind of denomination. He said, you know, we, 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 we kind of believe that homosexuality is a minor sin, kind of like shoplifting. <laughs> I am not making that up. So I thought, well, if Jimmy Carter from Plains, Georgia could give this his blessing, I guess we're all right. I forgot what the third story I was going to tell it was. What is it? Uh, anyway, I forgot. It'll come back to me eventually. So I, I never thought about it after, the, after we ran re-election. The reason I ran for re-election is I wanted the stamp of the people of Vermont on the bill, and I figured if I could get re-elected, then they'd put their okay on it. So interestingly enough, that race, I had two races against the same person. And I knew exactly who Sarah Palin was when I, when I saw her get up there, because this woman, for those of you from Vermont, was a dead clone of Sarah Palin's, except, of course, she ran first. Very attractive. This, this is where McCain made his big screw up. So Sarah Palin is attractive. Maybe, not, maybe she's smart, maybe she's not well-educated, but I think she's smart. And she has this sort of quality that she talks about skinning mooses and all this kind of business. 
And I'd seen Ruth Dwyer's routine, which is exactly this. She was this tough farm woman, who, you know, was very attractive, very smart, but very undereducated. And she ran against me, and she, and she blew away the Republican opposition in the primary. And I realized, but when I, I remembered something about her after the fact, which I then re connected with Sarah Palin, when I used to go through the legislature's the cafeteria once a week, I'd go through and glad hand the legislators and so forth. There are always lunch tables and anybody can sit where they want. Sarah, I mean, uh, Ruth Dwyer, <laughs> Ruth Dwyer was always sitting at the biggest table and was surrounded and you couldn't get a seat and everybody else at the table was a man over 60. <laughs> and when Sarah Palin came on the scene after the first couple of days when I got the hang of her drift, I knew we were going to win because while men over 60 loved her and drooled over her, their wives absolutely hated her. And, and none of the women would sit with Ruth Dwyer because she was this person like that. And, and so I thought, you know, the Philadelphia suburbs, which are an absolute swing vote full of Republican women, the way that Republican women in the suburbs of Philadelphia will tell you what's going to happen in Pennsylvania. And I bet not a damn one of them voted for Sarah, uh, McCain because of Sarah Palin. He already had the over 60 white male group. And now he just reinforced it with Sarah Palin. It was an enormous mistake because they didn't pay attention to what they were doing when they picked their, picked their person. Next question. Hi, my name is Julius Polo. I'm a junior at college in uh, Bronx, New York. Uh, so you were governor for uh, a number of years, and then obviously you went on to run for president. Um, what I was wondering was, what was that transition like from being candidate uh, and you know, realize you lost the campaign to becoming um, the chairman of the party and what obstacles did you face and what goals did you have as chairman of the party? Um, well, I, I did, obviously when I dropped out of the race in February in Wisconsin, Wisconsin I didn't think of running for the DNC that popped into my head. Um, but then we went back and turned the um, campaign, the campaign was full of people like you who are really deeply committed to long-term change. It wasn't just about the campaign. And a whole, a whole bunch of people actually ran for office out of that who were in the supporting crowd. And I asked them to do it and they did. And there's one lady who was here in Brattleboro, she's not here tonight, who ran eight years ago and is now serving her fourth term in the New Hampshire legislature. Um, so there was a lot of activism. So we start, we turned, this is another similarity between Obama and, and us. We turned Dean for America into Democracy for Obama, uh, for America. Obama turned Obama for America into Organizing for America. Um, and um, so we kept moving that along. And, and then at some point I figured, well, we should run, the Democratic Party really needed fundamental change and there wasn't a way of doing that except to run the DNC. Uh, and so my brother Jim is, has been running Democracy for America uh, in Burlington for a long time now. Um, but the DNC race was interesting. It's a real campaign. We had 10 staff. Uh, you have to, there's only three, uh, 477 people who vote, but you've got to go visit them all, all over the country. Um, and there wasn't a single person in Washington that wanted to be the, D, being to be the DNC chair, which made it all the more satisfying. Um, <laughs> And the other thing about it was um, the people in Washington had no clue, which is still, of course, true today. Uh, Washington is always the last, Washington is the last place on, in America that, where they understand what's really happening to ordinary people. And, you know, it's not all bad. Uh, there's a really interesting poll about six months ago that came out that showed that 65% inside the, of people inside the Beltway thought America was, thought was going in the right direction and their children's future would be better than theirs and so forth. The numbers were exactly the opposite everywhere else in the United States. So they're just completely out of sync. And the other thing about being the DNC chair when you don't have the president is you don't have to answer to anybody. Being the DNC chair when the presidency is your party is a nightmare because you don't do anything that without checking with the White House and they basically tell you what you're going to do and where you're going to fly and when you're going to do it. Well, I didn't want to do that. So I was there with, uh, with, when there was no Democratic president and we were able to, re to modernize the entire DNC with a 50 state strategy, with all kinds of new media stuff. We had a big faith outreach program. I canned all the Washington nincompoops that had been there for 20 years paying, uh, with us paying them a lot of money to tell us how to lose every cycle and hired a bunch of young people. We had a young African-American pollster by the name of Cornell Belcher who was 35 years old. He was the first Democratic pollster I ever met who understood that Democrats are values voters too, not just Republicans. We keep talking about issues all the time. You've got to talk about stuff that matters. And our values, of course, aren't the same as the Republicans, but va people vote their values. They don't vote on your 965-page position paper on X, Y, or Z. 
and, and Democrats do that too. And Cornell figured that out and that really helped us a lot in terms of, of figuring out how to take back the House and the Senate. Uh, there's a wonderful guy named Parag Mehta who uh, we all know because he worked in the campaign, then worked for us at the DNC, now he's in the Labor Department. And I did not know this, but our chairmanship was the most successful chairmanship in the history of the Democratic National Committee. I didn't know that. Because when we started, we didn't control the House, the Senate, or the presidency. And when we finished, we controlled all three in four, a four-year period. Just by, just by using stuff like the 50-state strategy, which nobody from Washington would, would, have, would have ever thought of. Because it was counterintuitive. volunteers for New York State and ready to report for duty whenever you're ready to run. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I have lots of questions for you, but I'll just go with this one, and I don't mean to rub it in. But I was in a room in Iowa that night, and I had a completely different perception. We drove home all the way uh, back to New York with no AM radio talking about what happened that night. And we got home thinking, yeah, we're ready. What's next? I'm wondering for you what your perception was leaving the room that night. Oh, it, it, my perception was the same as all the papers. Nobody wrote a story about that speech because nobody thought it was unusual. But as you know, what had happened is Mike was plugged directly into the TV, so there was no sound in the room. And that's how the, and the cable stations being the cable stations, they, uh, Diane Sawyer actually apologized for it about 10 days later, but it was a little late by that time. But, you know, that did not cost me the, the election. If, you, if you're supposed to come fir in first in Iowa and you come in third, ask Hillary Clinton what happens to you. I mean, those are the things that you don't want to have happen. So the problems were not the scream speech or what the Fox News or the media did with the scream speech. The problem was the mistakes that we made getting, going forward into the Iowa, Iowa caucus, and that's why we didn't win. And that, was, that happened to be the year that it was a very contested race between five significant candidates, I guess six. And, um, and whoever won Iowa was going to go all the way, and that's exactly what happened. Kerry w was done. After he, was, uh, he did Iowa, he, then he just pretty much ran the table. I think Edwards won two, and I won two, and that was it. Next question. Hi, I'm Jen Bertley. I'm the Vice President of DFNYC. I met you guys coming in. Um, my question is kind of a little bit more for Kate. I try to fancy myself a little bit of a writer, and and I was going to ask you a little bit about what your process was like, like how much, you know, note taking or, you know, journal making did you do when in preparation? Did you know you were going to turn your notes into a book or, you know, what were you thinking? And, and then what was the sort of collaborative piece of how you guys, you know, your experiences together? Good question. Um, I actually, throughout the entire campaign, it was never my intention to write a book. I didn't give it a second thought. It was, you know, when you're doing a campaign, the last thing you're thinking about is something else that you're going to do. So For some people. <clears throat> right. <laughs> right. If you read my book, you know, some people are thinking what they're going to do. Some, pe some people already had their book out by May after right, the campaign right. was over. Right. So I had, I had no intention of writing a book or anything. And it was... Um, when I got back to Vermont, or I actually was living in Vermont and born and raised there, but when the campaign, you know, we spent all of our time flying around, so you were, we were in Vermont one day a week, we'd fly around the country for six days, we'd come back for one day. Um, and my family was in Vermont, but you, between time zones, changes, and just how it's scheduled, and when you're in Iowa, you get no cell service. You know, I was barely able to talk to my family, and they pretty much knew what I did based on what they saw on TV, or I wrote a blog, so they would follow the blog and go, oh, that's where Kate is, or that's, you know, they see me on C-SPAN and they call me up like, we see you on C-SPAN. But that was basically what they knew, you know, that I did. And so when I got back to Vermont, um, it's really, you think everybody knows what you've been doing, but you this realization that people really don't know what I was doing, or they see it in a different perspective than I saw it. So I, um, and my brother's a writer, so he was like, you've got to write this, you've got to write this, and I've never written anything beyond like 10 page college paper, you know, in my lifetime. So I wrote a first draft. I sat down and I thought, well, I don't know how to do it, but I'm just going to do it. So I wrote a first draft. The first draft was the most negative thing. I, I look back now and it's almost like, oh, I can't believe I was so angry and negative. Because when you're just coming off a campaign, when you see, you know, the press was horrible to us and the other candidates were horrible and, you know, the end was horrible. So that's what I wrote. I just wrote everything was horrible. 
And I thought, you know, I just thought, I gotta just put this aside because, you know, maybe I'll get some perspective. So it took me about a year later, I thought, okay, I gotta start this again. So I picked it up again and I read how horrible everything was and I said, okay, you know, it wasn't that horrible. Let's, let's look at this. And the, all the information in this book was um, compiled by papers that we had during the campaign. We had every, a daily schedule. Um, we had news clips that we got. We had memos that we had. And Howard's a, the only reason I had this stuff is because Howard's an avid recycler. And as we were traveling around the country, you know, there were, I did, couldn't find recycling bins, so I would stuff it in my suitcase, I'd come home and I'd dump it. So I had two years worth of you know, papers, this is sky high. And you know, when I was going through, I thought, you know, I'm gonna organize all this stuff by day. So I organized it all by day. Um, I had a lot of spiral notebooks when, I don't want to offend Howard, but when he would say something that maybe he shouldn't say, I'd have to, you know, I'd write it down because I'd have to report back to Burlington. Oh gosh, you guys, here's what Howard said. So, <laughs> so I, had, I literally have, you know, I have like, you know, a stack of these spiral notebooks with all these little notes on, oh no, here's what Howard said. And, you know, it came in handy when I was sitting down writing the book. <laughs> Um, I also had, and this is my family's idea, and I thought they were crazy, they gave me a video camera, and they said, you know, you should just video things. And, you know, I did it, and I'm really actually glad I did. I just have hours and hours and hours of behind the scenes video. So when you read this and you say, you know, I have, I think I have one thing where I talk about the holes in Howard's socks. Well, I have video of the holes in Howard's socks. So <laughs> it's, 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 and it took me years to, to do it because I, did a, I didn't have a research team. I just, I did it by myself. Um, so, but it's a comprehensive thing. And people ask me, like, why did it take you so long before, you know, it, it came out? Well, first of all, I didn't think I was ever going to show it to anybody beyond my family. But second of all, I look back, I wanted something to be thoughtful. And again, that's why when I saw the, the super negative, super negative version, I'm like, you know, the campaign, I, I have to put it, I have to sleep and eat for about a year before I can put it all in perspective. So I wanted something that was thoughtful, wasn't rushed. As, you know, as Howard said, somebody on our campaign staff, they left the campaign in January, and in May they had a book out. And you know, I always want to, if, if we were still speaking, which we aren't, if we were speaking, I would say to him, you know, do you wish you had waited? Because if you would read the book, would you read your book now and think, oh, you know, I was writing it on the perspective of, I had only left, left the campaign, you know, four months ago. So I think that I, I, I actually came out with a very, I think, thoughtful and comprehensive, and, and I, I might, it's a, it's in perspective, and it's not the, if I keep, you know, people have asked me, we really want to see that angry version, you know, to get the, to get the real scoop. But, um, so that's, it took me a long time, but I'm glad I spent the time doing it. Next question. Yeah, hi, uh, Dave. Uh, I'm just curious, the campaign that's currently going on now that has some similarity to your own as Lauren Paul's campaign. Uh, small donations, a lot of internet reach. And um, today, you know, the Times uh, had an article uh, noting that his campaign had really not caught on. And I'm just curious, uh, kind of shift gears here a little bit, uh, why you think his campaign has not uh, gotten more traction? It has a lot of young people. Uh, I think probably not as much as ours, but it definitely has traction. Because they think he's honest, and they said he says what he sa thinks what he says. Younger people in this country are, have a strong libertarian streak. Um, they're not libertarians, but they have a strong libertarian streak. I think the fundamental problem with the Paul campaign is that Ron Paul has never governed anything, which means that you can espouse what I think is nutty theories. I mean, Ron Paul is not everything Ron Paul says is nutty, but it's nutty to think that we have to have an isolationist foreign policy, and it's nutty to think we ought to get rid of the Fed. And the Fed's there for a reason. We may not like the Fed, but there's a very good reason they're there. Uh, and it's nutty to think that this, there's such a thing as an institution, that is, there's no such thing as an institution that's too big to fail. I mean, he, he said we shouldn't have any of the bailout money and we should have let Citicorp go bankrupt. Well, if you had, the entire economic system in the world would have collapsed. So that's a problem. And I think the reason is when you're a, a representative, which is what he does, or did for a long time, you can say all these crazy things. But, you know, and, and nobody cares because you're, you're not running the place. But if you're running, the, this is why I think governors generally make better candidates than people who haven't have any experience running anything. 
is because you get tempered in your views about what's possible and what's, what's desirable, and there's a difference between what's desirable and what's possible sometimes, and you just have that streak. I mean, I, I, think, I think Ron Paul serves a valuable function, because I do, do think that he is, does say what he thinks, and I think that's valuable in politics. But I also think that uh, he's never had to make the kinds of decisions that would make him think about whether his ideology was really as useful. I, I don't think any ideology is useful. Because eventually, you always run into a, a practical situation where you can either do it by the book or you can do it by what's in front of you. And if you do it by the book, you always usually end up making, if you don't care what the facts are, this is what the problem is with why Republicans can't run anything. They're great at getting elected because they're incredibly disciplined and they stick to the story. The problem is they don't care what the facts are. And you can't run anything, uh, a family, a, a hospital, a, a business, or certainly a country if you don't care what the facts are. And that's what Ron Paul's problem is. I don't think he really cares what the facts are. He doesn't make him up like the right-wing Republicans, but he just has this peculiar worldview where everything has to fit into it, and it's just that's not the way life is. Well, thank you. Next question. Hi, my name is Jim. I picked up your book. I read a dozen pages. It's a wonderful read. I'm looking forward to reading it, but um, I don't think I like the ending. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll see if she'll change it the next time. Right? <laughs> the second volume. Maggie, you let us choose. You know? <laughs> uh, it's funny, the first time I heard of you, I think I read it in a Newsweek link, somebody interviewed you in your garage. And I got I such a big kick out of it. What was it? Was it she was a reporter for, I've forgotten what magazine, and she was a really nice person. I liked her a lot at that, that point. The press was all horrible people, which they eventually proved that they mostly were. But, um, but the uh, the um, so I invited her to the house. And that time we had two kids who were I don't know, twelve and fourteen or a little older than that. And you know Judy is working full time. I'm working full time and running for president. And she walks into the living room, and her first paragraph is, visiting Howard Dean's house is a wonderful experience. He's a nice, open man, and his house looks like a bomb went off in it. <laughs> is that the story? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the, I, I'll never forget the first paragraph. And his house, his living room looked like a bomb went off, which was true. It was that you were really open. It's almost like this book reads. I mean, it's very... You know, you said what was on your mind, which was strange. You know? <laughs> well, I, I remember... I remember the third story I was going to tell you about gay rights. This is, the, this is the dark story. So around May, when it looked like I was starting to get some momentum and surge towards the, towards the front, I then became, of course, the subject of lots of reporting that kind of you don't like. And so there was a quote from a guy. Uh, so some reporter was in Ohio, which we hadn't gone to yet. And he was asking some Republican consultant about, well, this is, you know, this dean is running for president. He's signed the civil unions bill. Isn't that going to... Uh, you know, is, is that going to be a problem? And he said, you know, this guy's for gay marriage, and there was never going to be a question that anybody who's for gay marriage could get elected. And the reporter said, well, he wasn't really for gay marriage, and he signed the civil unions bill. It's not quite exactly the same. The guy looks over and he says, he'll be for gay marriage by the time we get through with him. <laughs> uh, Ron Jackson, I'm a 46-year uh, family friend of Howard's uh, mom. I went to a camp and I wanted to call her mom. <laughs> so, uh, we go back, way back. If they offered you the uh, chief of staff spot in the next next Obama uh, administration, would you take it? That's never going to happen. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Tom Crane. Uh, I have what is perhaps a rather naive question, but how? It is, is there a channel, an avenue through which ordinary folks can somehow communicate to the campaign ideas about how, how it might be pushed? I'm, <laughs> I've been thinking about how to phrase this, but basically, uh, I would like to, I would like to see perhaps sort of generic commercials. This is just one example. Generic commercials taking on the GOP, letting people all over the country know what the GOP really is, what a GOP victory would mean for you. And, uh, and I have this vision of a Republican elephant, computer-generated, that looks something like the, the 
mucus monsters on the Mucinex commercials. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the thing is, I have no idea how to get these ideas through to anybody. As, you know, for In general, we, our campaign tries to do that. Some do it much better than others. We had a, a, a the, one of the things we did, it, which doesn't get talked about very much, um, but this happened out of the cam came from the campaign, and then we did it at the DNC. Is the so what I used to call the two-way campaign. We had the 50-state strategy and the two-way campaign. That is, campaigns can't be just about talking at voters. You also have to listen to voters, and you have to incorporate. So what we did in the campaign was to create a feedback loop so could, people could talk to us on the net and talk and blog about different ideas, and. Um, I don't know who created this idea, but it might well have been somebody in the net. When Dick Cheney went down to have a big fancy fundraiser in Charleston, South Carolina, somebody got the idea or got from uh, maybe somebody out in Netland that I was to sit in front of a webcam in front of the computer and have a ham sandwich, and we could see if we could over online outraise Dick Cheney, which we did. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a great, it was a great, I mean, those are the kinds of ideas that came through. So, I'm sure that the Obama campaign has some sort of a portal that you can get in and give them ideas, and hopefully they have somebody reading it. Not all everybody's ideas are going to be taken up. They may just say, this is really interesting, but I don't think we can do it at this time. But I think it's worth it to a campaign to get the feedback, particularly of people who care enough to get on the, on the net and tell them what they think, because of course those are people who are likely to be pretty avid voters and helpers. It's me again. <laughs> My background is in market research and communications research. I had a company for 20 years. And now I'm doing sort of uh, uh, political economic research. And I'm amazed at how good the Republicans are. I mean, they make it up, but they, you know, very direct. And I'm amazed at how bad the Democrats are. I mean, it's, it's almost as if, how could they lose on health care when you get the specifics and three quarters of the people are in favor, and now uh, most people are against it. I mean, it, it, it's kind of, you have to try hard to lose that thing. Right. Well, it didn't have to be like that. There, it, all you needed was some sort of a public option that everybody could understand. If you had said this health care bill is a combination of the system we have now and Medicare, everybody would have understood it, but they felt somehow compelled to write a 2,800 page bill and pay Ben Nelson $100 million and uh, what's her name for Louisiana, $300 million for their hospitals. And it was a disaster, public relations disaster. So, I, you know, I, I do think that you, we have to do a much better job of being very focused on what we do, but we also have to actually produce something that's very focused. Look, I think there's, there's some good things in the health care bill and I hope the court doesn't overturn it. But it's not the health care bill we would have had if I'd been running this show because it's just so complicated nobody can understand it. And there are some good things in there that people like. The under 26 stuff, the no pre-existing conditions, the huge Medicaid expansion, which is going to cover half of the people who don't have any insurance. There's a lot of good stuff in that bill. But you wouldn't know it. And you can't sell it if it's so complicated that people can't understand it. Did you have a specific question for the governor? Yeah, I did. I just wanted to mention that going through the internet, I had about 20 problems that the bill solved, and I've never read that in the paper. I mean, specific important ones. It, well, anyway. No, it's, it's, if you can't explain something in five words, then it doesn't get explained in the paper. That's the problem. Nature of communications. And you could have explained the bill in five words, but not this bill in five words. Observing with some concern something that's going on now, what I guess we call voter suppression efforts, yeah. um, and particularly what seems to be starting to happen in Florida. And I have two questions. Really, one, did you ever encounter anything like that um, in, in, along your way, or even <laughs> attempted voter fraud? Um, and also, you know, do you have any thoughts about What's happening now and what we can do better? But voter fraud, there's 81 cases of fraud in the last 10 years in this country. Voter fraud only exists among the people who are doing the things that they're doing, like directing people to the wrong polling places and things of that sort, which several people went to jail for in New Hampshire. So, um, no, the, the, look, the Republicans believe that the fewer people the, the, the vote, the better. 
and I think it's despicable and it's anti-democratic and it's foolish. They think that they think that if you make it hard for people to vote, the only ones that care really enough to vote are more likely to be Republicans than Democrats. I don't know if it's true or not, but I think a democracy ought to be based on how, getting as many people to vote as possible instead of as few. What they've done in Florida is an outrage, but it's not surprising, and I think those people will pay a price for it. I, the reason I think Obama's going to win so big is because I think he's going to win in Florida and Ohio, where you've got two far-right governors whose agendas have been overturned uh, by the people in, in the case of Ohio, and the governor of Florida is, is at between 30 and 40 percent in the polls for a reelect. So that's not going to do them any good. And you know, the public is not stupid. They can figure this stuff out. They may not pay a lot of attention because they have other things they have to worry about, like their job. But they're not stupid, and, and they figure this out. And there'll be a lot of changes in a lot of places in the United States because of this stuff. And we'll undo some of those uh, voter fraud laws because there is no voter fraud except among the Republican Party. Uh, this is uh, actually a follow-up to the gentleman blue. Excuse me, I'm sorry, sir. I don't really make the this is about the direct feedback into a campaign. I just want to say that the Obama campaign does have two very concrete methods to do exactly what you're talking about, direct feedback, direct input from volunteers. Um, I, I, unless, there are others in the room, unless there are others in the room here who want to hear about that, I won't go into a minute or two of details, but if anyone wants to hear about that now, I'm happy to go into it. Hi. With all the experience you have to acquire between when you were defeated and now you have so much more experience, when are you going to run for presidency again? <laughs> well, what I always tell the, the sort of the standard answer I give to people like that, it's easy to decide you're going to run for president the first time because you have no idea what you're getting into. <laughs> After you read this book, any sane person would want to visit the psychiatrist several times before they decided to do it the second time. So the answer is you never say never in politics, but I don't know. <laughs> but in democracy, you never have to give up. You always try again. I, well, yeah, there are lots of different ways of trying. So we'll see what happens. Thank you very much. We'll sign some books. Oh, one more. Sorry. Uh, I'm Margaret. Um, I just wanted to ask you, who could uh, Romney take as his vice presidential candidate that would scare the tar out of Democrats? Marco Rubio. He's going to lose Florida unless he does. And so I think that's who he's going to pick. And he's already, already behind by six to one among Hispanics. So he's basically alienated two, you, I mean, they've, the Republicans have alienated lots of people, but the ones they've really alienated that, that are huge groups are Latinos, they're behind six to one, and women. Susanna Martinez. Yeah, so he, may, he could pick Susanna Martinez, and I think she's probably being vetted. She's the governor of New Mexico, who's probably a better candidate, because um, Rubio may or may not have stuff that won't, won't vet. But I'd, I'd, I'd bet they're both of them are going to be in the final whatever number uh, that he comes down to, to to make his pick. And then a lot of it has to do with personal chemistry, too, which is, for Romney's case, you know, is going to be interesting because he's going to want to pick somebody who's buttoned down like he is. And that'll be, fa I mean, a lot, another name that's been uh, thrown around is, um, is uh, John Porter from Ohio. And uh, uh, it was it Rob Portman? I can't remember which one of them. But anyway, uh, and he's sort of a business guy. He's got a, actually got a quite a good record and so forth for a Republican. And so um, I, there'll be an interesting collection. And it, at the end of the day, it won't be just about electoral calculation. It'll be about the chemistry he has or doesn't have with, uh, with the potential nominee for vice president. One more? Uh, Governor, good evening. Um, question has to do with uh, the recent Supreme Court decision to allow corporations to give money to political parties um, in an unabated fashion. Uh, my question has to do with uh, individual donations and grassroots movements. Uh, I need to find your opinion on whether you think um, that uninhibited uh, way of manner of giving money to political parties would affect uh, how uh, grassroots movements feel about their involvement in the political process, whether or not they feel that uh, they would be alienated um, from participating in the political process uh, because of uh, that, that really unhealthy marriage, quite frankly, in my opinion. I'm very cynical about a lot of uh, issues uh, relating to the, the democratic system now. But um, really and truly, how do you think uh, that really affects uh, the work that grassroots movements uh, does? I, I
Especially for the younger generation, grassroots roots movements are, um, are likely to be very successful. I do think that the, um, the Citizens United decision, which is the one you were talking about, has demoralized some national grassroots organizations. But the truth is, change comes from the bottom, not from the top. So I think a lot of grassroots organizations, this is particularly true of, your, of the younger generation, really focus on local stuff. And there, you don't get a lot of problems with super PACs because they pay attention to the presidency and the senators and all that. So by making fundamental local changes in the community through grassroots action is how I actually think you get changes that eventually percolates up. Uh, very little percolates down. Um, so, it, you know, certainly Citizens United has been a disaster for the country, but um, I still think the potential for enormous change, particularly in the younger generation, is enormous because, because they're mostly interested in local uh, stuff and, and change one life at a time, which is something our generation didn't try to do. We tried to change the system. And I think people who are younger, in the younger 20s and so forth, are really trying to change individual lives. And you can see that in a lot of, a lot of different ways. Thank you, everybody. Uh, just, I want you to say who seats first. Um, we're going to go first. We have one more? One more. All right. One more. One more. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Jonathan. I was a big supporter of your 2004 uh, campaign. I was wondering, uh, looking back, uh, if you could do it over again, is there one or two things you would have done differently? <laughs> Some of them aren't nice. <laughs> We would have made a few personnel changes in September when I was intending to make them, but I didn't make them because we were leading the, leading the pack by that time. I didn't want a story about Dean shakes up campaigns while you're in the front of the pack. So that was one thing we would have done. Uh, we would have sent somebody to Iowa who understood Iowa uh, much earlier. Because one of the problems was the Iowa operation wasn't what we thought it was, and I didn't understand Iowa. It was the only state I really didn't understand because it's such a, such a complicated thing. Um, so those are two of the things. Kate, what do you think? Um, if you read my book, you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right, we'll go sign. And um, Howard's mom, of course, for coming. That would be great. Thank you. I failed another one.
Thank you. 